So just a quick, uh, I, I, first, if there are questions, in fact, um, on last time, it's a, it's, a, it's a good time to do that. So just maybe I can just um, uh, mention what we've done last time, just a quick recap, and then we can, we can go straight to questions. So we finished looking at uh, dispersive readout. Uh, and yesterday, we focused on some of the challenges. So how do we optimize the, 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 the speed, the, the measurement time, or make the measurement time as short as possible and increase at the same time the SNR? And we saw that there, was many, there were many constraints. So we know, for example, that we can optimize chi over kappa to some specific value. Um, but then there are limits on kappa, which couldn't be too big, chi which can, could, by itself, which cannot be too big, the photon number, which would trivially be a way to increase the, 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 the quality of the measurement, in fact, turns out to cause more problems. So it's a highly constrained uh, problem, but it's a problem which can be solved. Uh, I've also mentioned squeeze state, the fact that squeeze radiation uh, which intuitively should help because we're trying to measure a phase and we know that squeezed, uh, squeezing helps us go from uh, the standard quantum limit to, uh, 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 to, to beat the standard quantum limit. But here it's not so trivial because we're trying to measure a large phase. Something which I didn't mention is that there are ways around this. We can in fact uh, use squeezing, but in more uh, complicated settings, there are ways to exploit squeezing to improve uh, qubit readout. But okay, if I have time later, maybe I can say a few words about that. And then I moved on to uh, a new section, which was regimes of light matter interaction. And uh, uh, we mostly focused on the James Cumming Hamiltonian, in particular, the, the resonant regime where the qubit uh, detuning with a cavity is zero. And we looked at the consequence, uh, uh, which was the vacuum ready splitting, the fact that in the absence of a qubit, we would see only transitions at the resonant fre frequency in the, in the presence now of, the, of a coupling to the, to the atom, to the qubit. Uh, there's no longer any levels at the resonant frequency. Uh, the levels are split by 2G, and we can probe this in a transmission experiment. Then uh, I moved on to uh, the dispersive regime, and we were now looking at consequences of this of this regime for in the context of, of qubit spectroscopy. We already had looked at this regime, of course, for qubit readout. Essentially, when we packaged this term together with that term, we saw that this corresponded or could be inter interpreted as a pole, as a change of the cavity frequency, which was now dependent on the qubit state. Now we decided to package these two terms together, and we saw now that this corresponded to a change of the qubit state, which depends on the photon number, the AC starting shift. OK, so that's essentially what we were saying yesterday. Are, are there questions on this before I continue? Um, so if not, um, Oh, and some, uh, I just, uh, as you know, as you, uh, uh, I just want to mention that the next thing we'll do once we finish the discussion about the dispersive regime, uh, after that, I don't think, unfortunately, that I will have time to go to the ultra strong coupling regime. Maybe I can say a few words uh, at most, but then I will go to uh, a presentation on ways to measure sing single photon detection using these ideas of circuit tweeting. So it will be a slightly different. Uh, um, it will be a slightly different presentation where I will use slides, in fact, rather than handwriting. So depending on how you much you like my handwriting, it might be better or worse, I don't know. Okay, so again, what we did is we wrote the dispersive Hamiltonian in this way, where the prefactor of sigma z is the, is the qubit uh, frequency, which is now has two extra terms. One is the AC stack shift and the other one is the lamp shift. Uh, and then we wanted to look at uh, spectroscopy of the of this qubit and the, 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 what, what are the consequences of the presence of these terms. Uh, and to do this, what, to, to first build an intuition to make sure that everybody was following, to build an intuition, what I said is, let's in your cavity, okay? And let's just look at, at spectroscopy of a plane atom. And in this case, we, were, we wrote the Hamiltonian and we said, okay, we can simplify this by doing a rotating wave approximation throwing away terms that oscillate too fast, that which will not contribute. Uh, and in a rotating frame, we wrote the Hamiltonian in this way. And then what we said is, well, okay, obviously, 
FINR plot not the equivalent of cavity transmission or cavity population uh, with versus frequency is now uh, population of the atom, so probability to be in the excited state as a function of the of the drive frequency. And of course, what we could should expect to see is a peak, a Lorentzian shape peak at the qubit frequency. And what we wanted to understand was the height and the line width of this peak. And so what I, I can do, in fact, is uh, jump here uh, and try the following thing. So this is um, a plot that I was hiding, um, uh, whoops, in preparation for this, rather than jumping uh, uh, to, uh, to keynote as before. And so what, what this is a plot of is the, um, again, this probability of finding the, look at the left-hand side, eh? the probability of finding the, of having the atom in the excited state as a function of drive frequency. And let's just focus on this panel for now. And we see two things, but the, the different blue lines correspond for correspond to different uh, uh, drive amplitude. So this parameter omega r, this radi frequency, is uh, uh, which in, in the absence of delta q would be the radi frequency. So the drive amplitude uh, uh, is small and, and gets bigger. So two things that we see is that the height of the peak uh, increases and saturates at a particular value, which is uh, one half, and that's called qubit saturation. So you, if, you, if you drive very strongly the qubit in steady state, it will end up uh, here uh, at one half. That's a very different behavior than a harmonic oscillator and a cavity, where if you keep increasing the, the, the power at the input, the power at the output will change. That's just because the ladders of the harmonic oscillator are always the same. You can always put more energy. In a two-level system, you cannot always put more energy. Uh, you go from ground to excited to ground to excited. And on average, you're in, in the middle. And that's, that's what this says. The second thing you observe is that as the power increase, the line width also increases. And that's something which is called power broadening. Uh, the fact that by increasing the, the the, the 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 power yeah you are broadening the line width and so uh, because this is a two level system it's easy to get analytical formulas for these uh, for all of these quantities well in fact for p of e out of which we can extract uh, what we talked about and how we get these analytical formulas will be uh, essentially in the same way that i got this figure so this this i got from I could have done this analytically, but in fact, I think for this one, I don't quite remember, in fact, but I think for this one, I in fact solved the, the master equation numerically. And, and, and what is the master equation that I solved numerically, or what is the master equation that I need to solve analytically to get expressions for, these, for this P of E? It's a rather simple one. I've already included, uh, or rather discussed, master equations before. So now I can just write this master equation uh, and tell you, rather than having to explain what these symbols are, we know what they are. I can now just explain uh, uh, why they are there, what they mean. So you remember this symbol, D of rho was this dissipator, which had this jump and no jump term corresponded to dissipation. And before for the cavity, we had the dissipation of A, we were losing photons. So now we have a two-level system and the equivalent of A for a two-level system is sigma minus taking an excited state to the ground state. So that's relaxation, which happens at the rate gamma one. But there's other things that happen for these qubits. They, their, their frequency, uh, their energy can be, uh, uh, can fluctuate also, can be, there, there can be some random factor to that. And that can be captured by adding a term which goes as sigma z, which is the prefactor of the, of the, of the, the frequency, which is now something which is uncertain. And uncertain by how much, by uncertain by this so-called uh, term gamma phi, which is the, the so-called pure dephasing rate. So gamma one is uh, energy relaxation. And gamma phi is the pure dephasing rate. So if, if there are some people here which are used to working with uh, atoms, not artificial atoms, but actual atoms, sometimes calls called uh, atomic atoms to 
this differentiate them, differentiate them from artificial atoms. And so in these atomic atoms, uh, you will have obviously energy relaxation, but uh, typically uh, no or almost no purity phasing. Well, this term is often absent in the in that in the that literature. And because this is a, 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 a such a simple system, it's a two-level system, we can solve this exactly for a steady state by putting this equal to zero and solving for the right hand side for the state. And we get, if we do that uh, easily, uh, that it's, if you're lazy like me, you put this into Mathematica and, and about three lines of Mathematica, you find the following answer that the, the, the line shape is given by this function. Okay, so the line shape. Uh, uh, which is reproduced here, depends on the important parameters of the system, which are the Rabi frequency, the detuning, and gamma one, and now gamma two. Remember that gamma two is a combination of, uh, uh, of gamma phi and of gamma one. So this is, if this is the pure dephasing rate, that's the total dephasing rate. Uh, there you go, okay. And I believe other speakers have introduced uh, uh, these symbols. If they are not, please ask me questions and I can give intuitions, for example, if this was not given before of why gamma one energy relaxation should contribute to dephasing, we can have an intuition for this. Okay, so uh, the two observations that we made were that at large uh, omega r, uh, P of E goes to one half. We can get this from the above expression. And the second was the line width. Uh, which at uh, omega R uh, goes to zero uh, is given by two gamma two. I should be a little bit more precise, I think here. The line width, by that I need a full width at half maximum, at zero drive, or in the limit of zero drive, right? If I'm not actually driving, uh, there will be no response, okay? So it's in the limit of zero drive. Uh, this is twice the full dephasing rate. So this line width, okay, in the limit of zero drive is twice the dephasing rate. But whenever I start to drive a little bit too much, uh, at arbitrary um, at uh, arbitrary uh, omega r, we have something else. We have a formula which rather looks like this. Oops. It's a one. It's a square root, and so. This is the contribution which we already talked about. That's this contribution. And this is what I call power broadening. Oops. Okay. That's power broadening. Uh, uh, and that's, that's this uh, fact that now this line width is increasing as you crank up the power. You can think of this as some stimulated em emission. Okay. Uh, excellent. So now we really understand, or I hope so, if not ask me questions, we really understand spectroscopy of a qubit by itself, no cavity. So now we're ready to do spectroscopy of a qubit in a cavity. And what we would like to do is to avoid air power broadening. This is why I, I talked about that. You will see some sort of broadening, but uh, uh, it will not, I, I'll, I'll make sure that we are in a regime where power broadening is not important, is not relevant. So really in the in the linear regime where there, there is uh, there is no contribution uh, uh, to uh, from from this uh, from this term here okay so what we will really be looking at is the effect of the cavity on the qubit uh, during spectroscopy okay so uh, but the question you you may ask before we do that is is okay how do we actually do this experiment in circuit QED? Okay, so how do we measure 
uh, P of V as a function of, of, of frequency. Uh, well, we know the answer to that, but that's the all purpose of the all of the all lectures, the lectures that I gave in the last uh, few days. And the way you do that is simply to have your cavity with your atom, which is a two-level system. And now we will take this atom to be driven with some tone omega r, and we're trying to uh, cause radiations of this of this of this uh, qubit. And at the same time, what we will do with some amplitude epsilon, the same symbol that I used yesterday, we will look at transmission. And so what we're looking for is a change in transmission uh, with uh, the, the qubit, uh, with a change in the qubit state. But, but uh, recall that what we have, remember we have these uh, these phase space representation with the two blobs corresponding to, uh, to E and G. And remember that we have this phase phi, okay? And this phase essentially is what we're measuring, roughly speaking. And we gave an expression for this phase, okay? This phase in steady state, the expression that I gave yesterday is that this was arctangent of plus or minus two chi over kappa. It's an expression that I gave yesterday. But now, rather than writing plus or minus, what I will write is what it should really be, sigma z, or the expectation value of sigma z. And so what we see is that in uh, the limit of at least small chi over kappa, uh, this phase that we're measuring is a good proxy for sigma z. So what we're doing in circuit QD is not actually plotting P of E versus frequency. What we will be really plotting is phase of the transmitted signal, the phase of the transmitted signal versus frequency, but these two things are equivalent. And this is why in this plot here, that you're saying again, on the right, on the left hand side, sorry, at plotted P of E, and on the right hand side, so this right hand side actually uh, uh, applies also to this panel. So on the right hand side, what I was plotting is the phase that you would measure in such a measurement. Okay. And so you see that this phase uh, takes some value, which is here negative minus 40 degrees, depends on chi over kappa simply, and uh, that this phase was changing uh, in response to the rabbit tone on the cavity. So what you have is a qubit which is continuously measured. You're trying to rabbi uh, flop it. Uh, uh, and when you hit the resonance, the qubit change, the qubit uh, changes state. As a result, the cavity changes states, and there's a response in the transmitted signal. Okay, does that sound good? Questions on this? If not, um, we're back to what we want, I really wanted to, to talk about, which is recall um, what was the Hamiltonian we had. Okay, the Hamiltonian we had was this. which was, again, the AC stack shift plus the lamp shift. And now what we're doing is, is plotting P of V, where we're doing this measurement, P of V or, or phi, uh, the phase, whatever. Now we know it's the same thing, but um, I'll just plot P of V. It's the same thing as a function of frequency. Uh, uh, but now remember that how we're doing this, right? Okay, I'll just... Um, I need to uh, copy this. So that's, I guess, the one advantage with respect to a blackboard, we can do these things. Okay, so now what I will be doing in this thought experiment is that I will be uh, driving the atom at a very weak power, just to make sure that it's not, uh, there's, no, uh, 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 there's no power burden. Okay, I'm just tickling the qubit. And then what I will do is that I will uh, do spectroscopy. So I will change the frequency, uh, sorry, the frequency 
I, I, that's not, I didn't write the right thing here. I will change the frequency of this um, of this of this of this um, uh, of this tone. So I'm changing the frequency of this tone here, and then I will plot what I expect uh, to see uh, for different measurement powers. So fixed spectroscopy power, changing measurement powers. Okay. So for weak measurement power. What I expect to see is a Lorentzian. Obviously, this is what I keep telling you. I expect to see a Lorentzian uh, centered at the qubit frequency, okay, uh, which is now shifted by the lamp shift. So I expect to see a Lorentzian at the shifted frequency. The question that I ask now and uh, Please, someone uh, uh, answer this question: Is what should I expect to see if I now increase the measurement power? Basically, no, I, can, uh, I can overrun the critical current of the Josephson junction. Uh, I will make sure that I'm not doing this. Oh, okay. So always uh, uh, <clears throat> no dissipation here. OK, but let's think. So what I do is that I will fill the cavity with more and more photons. OK? If there's more and more photons, the new frequency of the qubit the frequency of the qubit, which was omega a plus chi, should go to omega a plus two chi. How many photons there are plus the lamp shift. So what I'm expecting to see is a shift of the cavity frequency. I'm expecting to see a shift of, sorry, of the qubit frequency, of the qubit frequency to a new value, which is related to the number of photons that there are in the cavity. So I'm expecting to see a shift like this, where now this is omega a plus two chi n, let's call this n bar, the average photon number was still the one half. And I can, I can keep doing this. I can keep increasing the power. And every time there will be a shift to a new and higher frequency. Okay, so what I'm seeing is this AC strike shift. Oh, but I'm also something, please let me know if there's a question, but I'm also seeing something else. Uh, and this is just a, a drawing, but this is what we see uh, experimentally also. What I'm seeing also, what I'm drawing here is that you, I expect to see a broadening of this line width. And how can we understand that broadening? Well, remember that um, that when uh, I'm driving a cavity, I'm preparing a coherent state of the cavity. Okay, and the coherent state of the cavity is alpha that I'm preparing, and n bar is just alpha square. So the average value of the new qubit frequency is related to this. Alpha square is related to the, this, uh, this n bar, the average photon number. But it's not the average that matters because the formula doesn't tell me that the qubit frequency is in fact shifted by the average value of n. It's actually shifted by the operator n. The full distribution of n matters. And remember that alpha, a coherent state, is a sum over uh, Fox states over all Fox states, okay? And so really what I'm, I, I am seeing, why there's a broadening is that uh, 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 while at very low photon number, close to zero, there's a single Fox state that matters. It's roughly a zero plus a little bit of one. As the number of photon increases in this coherent state, there's a larger and larger distribution of Fox states. So really what we're seeing is this broadening is because what we're seeing is not that the qubit has been shifted by one frequency 
It has been shifted, in fact, by many frequencies. It has been shifted by 2 chi 1, 2 chi 2, 2 chi 3, and etc. Okay, and this overall line shape is that we are seeing is simply uh, 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 the, 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 all of these different shifts that we're not resolving. These are simply all of these different shifts that are giving something which looks like, like a potato. Okay, so what we're having is some sort of inhomogeneous broadening of the qubit line because of the measurement photons. Does that make sense? That's important because I want to go to uh, another, um, I want to bring this to the next level now. Because this uh, was the case if I could not resolve the different peaks. So if chi is smaller with respect to kappa and gamma, uh, uh, gamma two, so if, chi is small with respect to the all of the line widths that I can expect to see, then in fact, what, I, what happens is that I'm not able to resolve these different shifts. But what happens if chi is very large, okay? If chi is very large now, so this will be called a strong dispersive regime. I defined earlier the strong coupling regime, which was G overwhelming these quantities. But now I'm saying this is a strong dispersive regime where chi is also overwhelming chi, kappa, and gamma. So this is much more difficult to achieve because remember, yeah. uh, chi is something like G times G over delta. So and that's a small number. So chi is a smaller number than G. So that's a difficult thing to achieve. But imagine we could achieve that. What would you expect to see in that case? Can someone wants to try, wants to try? Um, we will see the, the individual peaks uh, for each uh, photon numbers. Exactly. Thank you. So if at a very low power, you see something like this, you will now expect if you have some coherence state alpha to see rather a peak which is shifted according to, well, not shifted, one which is shifted according to, okay, now there's a single photon. That's it. Uh, now there's two photons. Now there's three photons, et cetera. You expect to see uh, uh, all of these peaks, which before were not resolved. You only see the overall envelope. Now you expect to be able to resolve these peaks, which are separated by uh, uh, chi and whose width is related to kappa and gamma. That's, that's the two values that give you uh, with. Okay, but uh, is that the case? So let's do the experiment. And if we do the experiment, this is what we see. So this is a, an experiment. So this was uh, something which was looked at uh, back in 2006 uh, together with uh, Jay Gambetta. And that's an experiment which was done with uh, Jay, Dave Schuster uh, back in 2007. And what you see on the top panel, just focus on the top panel, uh, if you don't see my shared keynote slides, please tell me. Uh, I, according to <laughs> all indications, are that you should see this slide. So what you're seeing is the uh, is the qubit uh, line width. Okay, in that case, rather than measuring the phase, it's the amplitude which is measured. It's it's a small detail. You can extract the same information from amplitude. Also, as a function of the spectroscopy frequency, the drive on the on the on the qubit. And what you see is that are these extremely well resolved uh, splits, each corresponding to zero photon in the cavity, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. And by now, uh, you can get uh, more recent experiments, you can get much more dramatic number split. Uh, we call this a number splitting. You can get much more dramatic splitting of these different number peaks. And for fun, this corresponds to a coherent state. And what you see is something which has a Poisson distribution. But if you prepare instead a thermal state, you expect to see an exponential distribution. And this is what you see. So really, uh, you are seeing the granularity of the field inside the cavity. Um, yeah. 
uh, and so one reason why this is interesting. Okay, so first of all, uh, that's a nice result, I think. Uh, and why is that interesting, especially in the context of this school, in the context of uh, axion detection? Uh, no, I need to share this. And do this. Okay, so what we have, as promised, uh, so this is what we have. And each of these peaks correspond to zero photon, one photon, three, four, uh, et cetera, photon. And these peaks can be resolved. And now what I can do, for example, let me redraw this with the peaks even more resolved. Uh, and that's, that's not uh, impossible. Uh, uh, I mean, there are experimental plots which look like this. That means now that I can drive, say, the qubit at that frequency, okay? I can do an experiment where I prepare the qubit and it's, there's many versions of that experiment, but let me do this version. I can prepare the qubit in its ground state and now apply a pulse, a pi pulse, in fact, at this very specific frequency and only at that frequency, okay? So it's a pi pulse, I'll call this pi pulse n equals one. Okay, it's a pi pulse which will pi pulse the qubit only if there's a single photon in the cavity. Okay, and if I were to shine here, I would pi pulse that would be pi zero and pi two and pi three. It's a it's a it's a pulse which is conditional on the number of photons. Okay, and so if there happens to be a photon in the cavity, then the qubit will be promoted to its excited state. And this is something which I, I, which I can detect with the, the homodyne detection that we've discussed before. But uh, if there was no photon in the cavity, this pi pulse will not do anything because the qubit is in fact all sitting here. There's no photon, so the qubit has not been shifted. And so I can now measure and I say, oh, there was no photon in the cavity. So what did I just do? Well, I just created a single photon detector, a uh, but a very special single photon detector. I created a, a photon detector for, uh, for photons that are uh, appearing in a cavity, photons that, well, I can place them myself, but I can also imagine that I'm in a situation, imagine that I am in the following situation. Okay, I have uh, a cavity, okay, with a qubit, and uh, my my cavity has the weird tendency of suddenly uh, having a photon appear. Okay, something some sometimes this may happen. So what I will do is I will pipe all the qubit, measure uh, uh, measure the qubit, and I can say yes, photon was there. Let's, have to, let's say uh, just, uh, yeah, there was a photon. Or, yeah, no, there was no photons. Okay. So essentially what I'm saying is that I can measure photons that spontaneously appear in a cavity. That's exactly what an axion would do. And this is where I should stop talking about this because this is where it's not my own expertise and you have much better speaker than me to talk about that. But uh, if they have not already talked about this, they will, I imagine, uh, allude to this in, in other like in, in their next lectures. Uh, okay, so great. So we have a way to detect single photons. And that's a very powerful thing uh, to have. So in the rest of the lecture, I would like now to move to a different topic, which is like, in fact, this very same topic, which is uh, uh, single photon detection. But now I'd like to have a different type of detector. I would like to have a, a detector where I can detect a photon which is itinerant. Okay, I have a, a photon which was, for example, produced in some region of space here. Okay, so that photon is produced in some region of space say, here. And then it's leaking out of that region of space at KVT and going somewhere else. And now I want to have some photon meter 
which tells me is it zero or one? Is there a photon? So I want to to to, to measure that uh, itinerant photon, which was uh, uh, generated somewhere and then leaked out of a cavity and measured. There are many reasons why I would like to do that. And also, uh, I would like to do this in the microwave regime, of course. Huh? I'd like to measure microwave photons. Yeah, that's something which I, I should emphasize. It's not trivial because this is microwave energy. Uh, uh, it's much easier to, it's, we have very good single photon detectors at optical frequencies, but microwave photon uh, deposit orders of, of, orders of magnitude less energy than an optical photon. And it's very difficult to have a click from a single microwave photon. So it's a very active field of research to do that, to, to achieve this. And it's useful for quantum information processing. Uh, uh, you can do entanglement by measurement in a modular quantum computer architecture, for example. But it's also useful for uh, axion detection, uh, as you've heard. And uh, that particular setting is interesting because here, I could imagine having, for example, a large uh, B field okay, in a region of space, uh, which is far from my single microwave photon detector, which will be based on superconductors uh, and uh, would not like this large B field. Okay, If I were to put a large B field in that region, that will just kill uh, uh, all of the single photon detection. There would be no, no superconductivity left, no transpond left. There would be no way to measure the photon. Okay, so that separation in space is something which is useful. And I'd like to turn to that now. But for that, I'll turn to slides. And so if there are questions on what we just see now, this is a very good time. Yeah, I think there's a question. Uh, yes, so, uh, hi. Uh, my question is uh, on the uh, frequency resolution of these cavities. Do you have uh, an idea of to what, sensi to what uh, uh, sensitivity in the photon frequency uh, uh, we can measure uh, photons, for example? Uh, you're specifically talking about this one or the... the yes, the, the, the number frequency. splitting? Okay, good. Um, Right, uh, very important, uh, and uh, you'd like that to be tunable also uh, for um, uh, for to extend the, the range of uh, axial detection, for example. Um, well, the natural operating regime is really microwaves. Uh, you cannot go too low because uh, if you go too low, they'll you'll be overwhelmed by by thermal photons. Um, so you know three ish gigahertz becomes difficult. You cannot go too high uh, now for a technical reason because um, uh, microwave electronics, which is used to all to do all of these fancy pi pulses and, and homodyne detection is well developed below 20-ish gigahertz. But uh, this is something which could be pushed up. So you can go to some tens of gigahertz, but of course, eventually you start hitting the superconducting gap of aluminum, which is of the order of uh, 100 gigahertz. Um, so, okay, so a few gigahertz to a few tens of gigahertz would be the answer. Uh, and you can, in principle, make these cavities tunable. Uh, uh, the way to do that is to, it's like a trombone, right? You just change the, the, the size of the cavity. Uh, and there are ways to do that. Uh, you could imagine actually doing this by changing the size, but there are ways to do that with um, with Josephson junctions, with squids, essentially. Does that answer the question? Um, uh, yes, yes, thank you. Perfect. Any other, any something else? Okay, so. Um, if not, I will now stop sharing this and start sharing something else. Um, I shouldn't do that.
Yeah, okay, I'll just share in this way. That will be easier. Bear with me for a second while I'll Okay, good. So you should uh, again see the, the slides with the numbers spinning, but now we're moving on to something else. Um, and so again, this is a rather different uh, that was done in discussion with the uh, organizers. This is uh, uh, somewhat different now. This will look a little bit more like a talk than a, a summer school lecture, but I, I hope uh, you will be able to follow everything given what I've, uh, I've presented in the last uh, few days. And again, please at any time interrupt me. My goal is not to go over all of that. Uh, what I would like to talk is, yeah, single microwave photon detection of itinerant uh, photon. And I, I realize it's uh, my slide is not impressive because I realize that I should have changed a title. I will eventually go for broadband detection, but first uh, I would like to talk about uh, itinerant microwave single photon detection of uh, uh, with a, a detector that we've developed a few years ago and which was now realized by Irfan Siddiqui. And contrary to this title, it's not broadband. It's a, it's a narrow band detector, a few, uh, a few megahertz to a few tens of megahertz. And in the next uh, step, if I have time, I'll show some ideas that we have for a, a broadband microwave photon detector now with hundreds of megahertz of detection. And although work has not, Yet started uh, work this plan at uh, UC Berkeley and MIT towards that. Okay, uh, well, why do we care about microwave photon detection? Well, I've already said that. Uh, um, uh, speeding up the search for the for axon dark matter. Uh, uh, to be honest, when we started to our work on this, I was not aware of this. Uh, uh, it's only when we finished the, the work that I realized that, oh, it could have application uh, there. So I was really excited about that. But more generally, it's considered to be a missing piece of the microwave a quantum text toolbox, uh, useful for, for quantum information processing. And it's also an interesting tool for mesoscopic physics. Uh, and what I said before is that a difficulty here is that Compared, compared to optical photons, microwave photons, their frequency is such that they deposit much less energy. It's difficult to get a click from a single photon detector. Uh, but nevertheless, despite this difficulty, there's been over the last 10 years or more, there's been several proposals for itinerant. Now here I'm talking about itinerant migrate uh, single photon detectors. And there are roughly speaking two types of detectors here. The first type is a detector which has where you, the user has some a priori information on the arrow of time. So you say a photon will arrive at that time or, will, or it will not arrive. Can you, can you distinguish? But there's more interesting uh, uh, detectors and also more challenging uh, detectors uh, which are always on. Detectors that do not have any a priori information. You just want to have a click on a photon arrive. And that's what we're after here. And uh, I will show some experimental results, which are not published yet, but there, there's several groups that have already uh, did some, uh, some, some preliminary experiments in this direction with some already beautiful results. So there is there is efforts uh, in this direction in the, in the old field, in the field of circuit QED. Okay, so what, what do we want? We want a detector which is always on. We're also interested in a detector which is quantum non-demolition, a detector which will, in fact, not destroy the photon. Uh, we wanted to design something which was compatible with current experiments, and that was our wish when we did that. And uh, we did an OK job because now this was demonstrated experimentally at UC Berkeley, and I'll show results, as I said. And the design that we had suggested back in 2018 already suggested that we could move to a broadband uh, uh, version of that. So that's, that's interesting. And just to make sure I'm do, I have the timing right here, um, I keep asking these questions each time, but I have something like 40 minutes left. Huh? Uh, let me double check because I don't know when. Uh, so you should finish at 7.30. So you Perfect. have. Uh, 50, yeah. 
Okay, great. <laughs> so the 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 uh, so let's let's look at a toy model of what we want. Okay, so I have a photon. Uh, which will be traveling down some waveguide, okay? And at some point, there is some black box that will interact with this, this photon. And this black box is continuously monitored in such a way that when a photon arrives, this, this black box, uh, the, the, the detector of the on the black box will say, okay, there's a photon. But it's a QND detector, so the photon is actually not destroyed. So at some point, it has to go out again, and the detector will swing back to this small state. And I could measure the photon several times if I wanted. Good. So this, this is what we want. OK, let's do a simple, maybe naive model of, of what this absorber should look like. So here, here I've got the same thing. I've got the waveguide. I forgot. I didn't put the, the waveguide on the right now. We're happy to look at something where there's reflection. That's OK. So I replaced the black box by some absorber. Okay, that absorber will be a transmon qubit, will be a two-level system, and that's his two that's the two-level of the absorber. Okay, so that the, uh, the B mode will be the absorber mode. That's the black box in the previous plot. And the detector on the absorber will obviously, given everything that we said before, will be some cavity. Okay, some readout mode. And I, I know that I can I can continuously monitor this cavity using homodyne detection. And that's the phase space representation of this cavity, which I assume to start in vacuum. OK, so what is it that I want? What I want is something which measures the presence of a one quantum of energy in the absorber, OK? One photon. And so what I want is a quadratic detector, something which measures p dagger b. Is there a photon or not? That's difficult to measure. What I know how to measure, what is easy to measure, is homodyne, is a quadrature of the electromagnetic field of this cavity. OK, so this is what I said before. I can easily measure a chosen quadrature of this mode, of this readout mode. A. Great. So I know that I can couple readout mode to absorber mode using the dispersive interaction that we've talked about for the last few days. But let's right, not the interaction that we know how to do, but the interaction that we would like to do. So I'll just combine what it is that I want to what it is that, I, that is easy for me to do. And that should give me what is the ideal interaction Hamiltonian, the toy model for this, for this ideal photo detector. And this I, I, ideal Hamiltonian takes the form of what we know as a longitudinal uh, uh, coupling. And this is how it looks. So rather than coupling sigma z of the, uh, of the absorber, and by the way, sigma z of the absorber, uh, 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 oh, yeah, uh, I, I forgot. Something I should say, right? Uh, I, I, in the previous slides, I, uh, the previous days, I, I, I didn't have the b's and the b daggers for the, for the absorber. I treated it as a two-level system. Now I'm going back should say this, that's important. I'm going back to the notation that Jens introduced, the fact that these are, in fact, multi-level systems, and, and we will treat them in terms of the creation and aleation operators B. OK? If there are any questions about that, that part, please ask me. But that was covered uh, by Jens. So now, rather than writing sigma z, I write the equivalent of sigma z for a multi-level system, and that's B like B. OK? So that's, that's really equivalent to sigma z. So what I'm, I'm coupling is what I want to measure, B diagonal B, to, the, to a quadrature of the electromagnetic field. So what is what I want to what is easy to measure. And there is some coupling constant, she said. And this type of, it's called a longitudinal interaction. And that type of longitudinal interaction has been studied uh, quite a bit uh, in recent years. Uh, 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 in circuit QED for gates for readout and as, a, as an interesting tool to scale up quantum computation. And we know, in fact, ways to generate this type of interaction. But let, let's look at uh, what is the result, why this interaction is interesting. Well, <clears throat> the photon arrives. And the, 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 the photon is, let's say, is absorbed. OK, we assume it's absorbed. The, the qubit goes from 0 to 1. And so the expectation value of p dagger b 
goes from zero to one. And so now this term, which was on average uh, zero, uh, uh, because B dagger B was zero, is on average no longer zero. And so what we see is that this Hamiltonian, in fact, is reads, if B dagger B is one, reads like GZ times A dagger plus A. But we know what A dagger plus A is from with what we said yesterday. A dagger plus A is X for the, uh, the KPT mode, the readout mode, and therefore generates a displacement along Y. Okay, before I, I, I had called this X and P, now it's called X and Y. Sometimes it will be called I and Q in the literature. So you'll see all of these different letters, but uh, I think we can all recognize the phase space. And so this will be a displacement along Y. Great. And this is what I want to monitor. Okay, I'll be monitoring this cavity and I'll be looking for this displacement. Perfect. So let's look uh, if this toy model actually works. And so what we will do is numerical calculations now of uh, this absorber and the readout. And this readout is continuously monitored. And what I will call, what I will, um, uh, what I call uh, J is the output of this, uh, J will be the signal essentially, uh, okay. And now, uh, in addition to having the wave guide, which is uh, now as this other color, I need to, in a numerical simulation, I need to also add the single photon. I need to generate a single photon in my, in my simulations. And for that, the way we do that numerically is the same way you would do experimentally. You add a single photon source, say a two-level or a KVT, in which you place a photon and that photon leaks out, okay? It leaks out at some rate kappa, that's the coupling of the source to the waveguide. And then the absorber is coupled to the waveguide with some coupling kappa b. So that's the strength of the coupling between these two guides. And again, there's non general interaction at the strength gz here. And this readout cavity is monitored. And there's also a coupling strength, of course, between the, the, the input output port here for the monitoring and the, the readout mode, the cavity. So we can all simulate that numerically. And what we can do is in fact simulate using a, a trick which is known as quantum trajectories. We can simulate single shots of this experiment. We can generate one instance of the experiment and look at what the actual signal would look like experimentally for one shot. And what I'm showing you are two shots of this experiment, okay? And uh, uh, you see there's a shot where the signal is just noisy. And then there's a shot where the signal is noisy and goes up. And so what we will do is we will place a threshold here and we will declare that whenever the signal goes above the threshold, we will say, well, that's a click. There was a photon, okay? And so what you're really seeing, let me go back here. What you're really see, seeing, the, the signal is the fact that this blob has moved and you're seeing this in your output field. And essentially what I'm saying, this threshold is like putting a threshold here saying, okay, if the blob moves a, 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 above the threshold, declare click, otherwise no. Okay, so this is what we see. Good, so that's the actual signal that you can expect in a single shot of the experiment. Great, uh, but sometimes you see the detector actually didn't click, that's unfortunate. You can also generate trajectories where there was no photons. You didn't actually prepare a photon. You're just listening to vacuum. And then you see things that are mostly not moving, but unfortunately, sometimes some trajectories are going above the threshold and there's a click. That's a dark count. You don't want this. So you, you would have to adjust your threshold. You can move it up, move it up. You can, you, you, but that's a problem. You want to avoid these. Uh, these clicks. You can, you can move up your threshold, right? You decided that your threshold was here. So you can put your threshold here. But the problem is if you put your threshold to I, you will lose some of the photons because their trajectories will not go as, will not go above the threshold anymore. So there is, there's a, a trade-off here. And so we can repeat this here for uh, uh, 2000 times for each uh, cases, photon, no photon. And we, now decide where to place optimally the threshold to distinguish uh, these uh, these different types of trajectories: photons, no photons, blue and green. And we can compute the quantum efficiency. What is the number of eta, the number of, of clicks for the number of trajectories where we expected to have a click? 
And from that, we can uh, also compute the measurement fidelity, which is related to the dark count rate uh, and the integration time. And what we find is that this is not a great detector. <laughs> okay, we have uh, only 80% uh, fidelity or efficiency. Not great. We want much better than this. What's the problem and how can we solve this? The problem is that we're trying too hard. The problem is a, a form of the Zeno effect. Uh, uh, you know, the Zeno effect maybe is the fact that if you're observing a quantum system, you are essentially blocking its unitary evolution. Okay, you keep projecting it back into its its original state. You 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 prohibit the system from evolving. So what are we? Why does is this happening? Well, we're continuously monitoring this readout cavity, which is in a sense always monitoring the absorber mode. And so <laughs> from that effect, we are effectively prohibiting the photon from being absorbed because the photon, the, sorry, the absorber is key. We keep projecting back to the zero state where there was no photon. So by we're, we're, we're trying to, we're measuring too strongly the, the, the absorber mode. And of course, we, we want to measure it strongly because we want to have a strong signal at the output. So there is some optimization to be done here. And we cannot understand what is the optimization that we should be doing. So first, uh, what, are, what is the, um, uh, uh, yeah, so what is the, what is the root cause really of this, uh, a bit more precisely of this, of this back action of this Zeno-like effect? You can understand by looking at the Hamiltonian, yeah, the longitudinal Hamiltonian, to which I've added the Hamiltonian of the, the absorber, the transmon. And just as I've done before, we can rewrite this uh, uh, like this. So we spent an hour looking at Hamiltonian uh, similar like this, where this was a dagger a rather than a plus a dagger, but it's the same idea. So what you see is that now this is the frequency of the cavity, which is now displaced by the cavity field. And so what you have is that the qubit is no longer standing at, you should be seeing my cursor, by the way. If you don't see my cursor, please tell me. No, you, uh, you should, the cavity should be sitting here with some line width. But now, because of the coupling of strand GZ, the, this, this, uh, this, the, the position of, of, this, of the qubit is uncertain. And it's uncertain by GZ, by, by the, 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 the coupling strand. And so you're trying to do a transition to a level which is fluctuating, and it's fluctuating by how much? By GZ and divided by kappa B, the, the, the line width. Okay, so that's the order of the fluctuations. And so this is the quantity that I would like to minimize to make sure that there's no back action that the photon will be absorbed. So let's try to minimize this. The problem, if I minimize this, is that this is also the signal. If you think about it, is how much displacement is there? Well, there's a displacement is generated is, is here, right? And so that's the, the rate of the displacement is GZ, this prefactor. And for how long does this displacement occur? Well, for how much time the, the absorber uh, has a photon in it? And what's the typical time the photon will stay the absorber? Well, it's one over kappa B, one over the decay rate. Okay, so the displacement is something like GZ over kappa B, GZ, uh, GZ times uh, photon retention time, capture time. Okay, so I want this to be as small as possible and as large as possible. We cannot do this, but there's a solution. Uh, so what we will do is we will keep this constant and as large as we can, but we will try to change the absorber time. How much time does the photons spend in the presence of the absorber. And this, we have an indole on it, but we need to use some interesting tricks. What we will do is we will replace the single absorber by a small ensemble of absorbers. So if I had one transmon, now I have a few transmon. Think four, five transmons. Okay, and they will all be coupled to the same measurement cavity, which is probe. Why is that interesting? Well, uh, to understand why this is interesting, 
let's just focus first on the absorbers and forget this KVP. Okay. The one thing to understand, the one thing to realize is that a microwave photon is a long object. I, I keep uh, drawing it as a small object, but it's in fact a very long object. Uh, frequency of, um, yeah, if you think about the wavelength of a, of a photon, we're talking about uh, centimeters and the, the decay times we're talking about for the sources are long. And so these photons will be long objects. And so what you can do is you can organize these, these absorbers to be close enough without much interaction amongst themselves. But it can be close enough such that when the photon arrives, it, uh, uh, it does not see one. Essentially, it sees all of these absorbers at once. And so what you have is, in, is the interaction between this cloud of, of artificial atom, this cloud of absorber, and the photon. And so one, if, you, if you're monitoring here the photon, and you see that the photon has, has disappeared, is no longer traveling. Well, you know that the photon has been absorbed by one of these atoms, but you don't know which one, okay? You don't know which one because all of these atoms are as equally likely to have absorbed. They're all interacting the same way. The photon is so large that it's as if the, 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 it was arriving on this cloud of atom at once. And so what you should really think of, of this is some giant molecule Okay, some cloud of atoms, some giant molecule, which is absorbing the, the photon. And so we know that what uh, happens in this case is that we have so-called bright states of the cloud of atom and dark states of the cloud of atom. And so what is the bright state of the cloud of atom? Is the state where, I, exactly what I said, it's a state where you don't know where the photon, uh, in which atom the photon has been absorbed. Has it been absorbed by the first one? And so the first one has been promoted from zero to one, or has it been absorbed by the second or by the third and so on. And quantum mechanically, because we don't know which one, well, the state that describes this cloud of atom upon absorption is this so-called bright state, which is a coherent superposition of all of these possibilities. And that's a state which interacts strongly with the field. Okay, that's the state which uh, interacts with the field. But there are also a bunch of other states, dark states, which uh, have simply different phases. Okay, and these dark states, in fact, do not interact with the phase, you know, the, the the field. They don't. They simply don't have the right phase to interact with the field. Okay, but if you diagonalize the system, you find that, of course, there's a cloud of atoms. There must be multiple states. There's one which is strongly coupled, it's bright, there are some that are not coupled, they are dark. And so the way you should really therefore think about this situation is like this. What you have is a, a photon that arrives uh, on this absorber, which remember is monitored by a cavity. But of all of the possible states that this absorber can take, there's a single one, the bright state which interacts. And there's a bunch of other states, the dark states that are in fact not they are essentially uncoupled now uh, uh, with the incoming photon. Okay, so you have a bright state which is strongly coupled now, in a sense, even more strongly than before to the input line, and all of these other dark states. Great. Uh, uh, importantly, these dark states are, however, still in interaction with the monitoring cavity. The cavity itself is still monitoring all of that. It's simply this input port, this in incoming waveguide, which is now only stuck coupled to the bright state. It's bright only with respect to this incoming waveguide. Why is that a good thing? Well, uh, now what uh, happens, the, the qubit is absorbed. Sorry, the qubit, the photon, qubit, what am I saying? The photon is absorbed. Uh, uh, and so eventually it will be remitted. Okay, absorbed and remitted. And so far we didn't change anything. We didn't add any value. What we will now do is a simple trick, is we will slightly detune the different uh, uh, absorbers, the different qubits. And in that situation, the, this thing, the, the, the distinction between bright and dark state is lost a little bit. In fact, the dark states become a little bit coupled to the bright states. They become bright a little bit. 
And so in effect, what arrived is that if there's a little bit of detuning delta between the different qubits, what happens is that there is a coupling from the bright state to the dark state. OK, so what happens now? The photon arrives. It's absorbed by the bright state. But now there's a coupling. So now that bright state will be, the, the photon excitation will be transferred to a dark state, and then to another dark state, and then to another dark state. And eventually, it will be transferred back to the bright state. And once it's transferred back to the bright state, there's a large probability that it will be emitted again. It will be ejected uh, uh, back into the transmission line. OK, so the photon arrives. It's absorbed. But rather than re-emitting rapidly as before, what happens is that there's a transfer to the dark state. And now it's lost in all of the different possible dark states until it rephases in the bright state and is emitted. So what we've achieved is we've uh, uh, now uh, um, what we the, the great thing that we've achieved is that the photon spends more times in proximity of the absorber mode. It's now spending more time in this cloud of atom being interrogated by the absorber mode. And so the time is no longer limited or set by this input uh, uh, port coupling between the the, the qubits and the waveguide. It's also limited. It's also set by some trapping time. How much time is the photon trapped in the vicinity of this absorber in these dark states? So we've increased the displacement because we've increased the trapping time. And we can do, we can increase this now uh, without increasing the measurement back action. So we can work on minimizing this measurement back action, making sure that there's a large probability that the photon will be absorbed while not having any cost on the displacement the, on the, our ability in, in fact measuring of seeing the presence of the photon. Does that make sense? Are there questions here or about anything else? Well, um, I see no question. So what I can do is I can, um, Look at, uh, I can, I gave, I gave some intuitive understanding. Now, now let's uh, look um, at uh, beyond some intuitive understanding. Does this actually work? And so, what I will plot now is the uh, population of our absorber as a function of time. Okay, so this population of the absorber as a function of time. And I will do that with one absorber, again, ignoring the presence of the probe for one absorber, so two, three, four, et cetera, well, up to four. Okay. And so this is what we see uh, as a fun, that's an analytical calculation. So we see the absorber uh, uh, population as a function of time. Uh, so what we see is that there is an absorption, uh, there's a um, yeah, we see two things. We see, uh, 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 essentially look at this big blob here. What you see is an absorption and a slower emission. And roughly it's absorbed by a time that I call T star one. This sharp feature at the beginning is, uh, is a, a feature of the line shape that we've chosen. So you might wonder why, why the photon I keep drawing like this. Um, um, Ask me a question, or yeah, okay, I, sh I should say it probably. The photon I draw with this line shape because this is a photon which is emitted by a, 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 a system that is relaxing. So if you prepare a source, a cavity or a qubit, in an excited state and let it relax, this is the shape of the photon that will, it will emit. What you're seeing is the mirror image of, a, of an exponential decay. And so you see that there's a sharp rise here, and that sharp rise does all sorts of funny features. That's something that we can deal with, but I have not uh, here. OK, uh, I can increase the number of absorbers and more and more. And what I see is that by increasing the number of absorber, I trap the photon in the proximity of the, uh, in the absorbers, in the cloud of absorber for longer and longer time. So I succeeded in doing exactly what I wanted. So now 
uh, yeah, we can plot the trapping time versus number and we see that the trapping time increases exactly like we wanted. Okay, so now I can redo the same numerical calculation as before. Now, you remember I was doing this cascade, this, uh, yeah, it's called cascaded quantum system where I have a source, I emit a photon or not. I look at the absorber, I, I let it absorb or not uh, in the B mode, and then I monitor continuously the A mode. And this was for one absorber. This is exactly the same plot as before. Now I'll do, I will do this simulation again with an increasing number of absorbers, two, three, and four. And what we see is that, um, uh, well, uh, uh, we see exactly what we wanted. While we, at n equals four, we see that there's a, there's a, a clear way, place where we can put a threshold where uh, all of the blue lines cross the threshold, but no, or almost no green line now cross the threshold. That's exactly what we want then. We can now have a really high efficiency readout of the presence of a single photon. Okay, so uh, if we compute now the fidelity as a function of the number of photon, uh, sorry, <laughs> the number of absorber, we find that it goes up to uh, almost up to one. Okay, we find a fidelity of 96% at n equals four absorber. We could put more absorber. We see that there's a diminishing return, but however, uh, it's still increasing. We think it, this would still, uh, uh, it will go up, that it will improve. But these numerical calculations become very challenging. So in fact, we did not do that. We stopped there. Uh, what this plot is showing is the, Efficiency, quantum efficiency, number of clicks over the number of trajectories, which is that click versus the number of dark counts. And the essence of this of this plot is that you can choose your dark count and your efficiency as you want, right? You can move these thresholds as you want. So by moving the threshold up, you're lowering the dark count but reducing the efficiency. And so you can you can choose your enemy. And so for the axion detection, for example, you would like to have very little dark, uh, dark counts. This is something you can optimize on. Oh, yeah. And uh, by the way, the, the, the big loss of efficiency that we're getting, uh, uh, there is a dashed line, which I highlight with the red uh, square or the red uh, color here. That is uh, simply due to the prompt reflection of the photon. This is, you remember I talked that, uh, here about the fact that, well, there are these very sharp features which are due to these very sharp features of the photon. So if we had generated instead of photon, which had something like a Gaussian waveform, uh, these, this sharp feature would, would, uh, would go and the efficiency would gain a few percent, in fact. We could also optimize a little bit better the, the we could also optimize a little bit better the kappa, the decay rate of this, uh, the source versus the kappa of the absorber. That's not something that we've played with much. And that would also uh, uh, help uh, remove some of this inefficiency. That's really just a, that's a technical thing, really. We can improve upon this. OK, so this is all numerical calculations. And remember, this is numerical calculation on the toy model. Now we want to see if the toy model can actually be realized. And so that's a possible implementation of this idea. And so what we have, I hope you will recognize, is this input waveguide. With n equals here three uh, transmond qubits as absorber, and they are continuously monitored by this, uh, uh, by this cavity, where, where air I represent as a as a as a as a coplanar uh, waveguide cavity, okay, which is continuously monitored. Remember that we wanted um, the the we wanted the atoms to act as a cloud of a single cloud of atom, uh, and there's a way to do that. In fact, this is not something which I should go into much details uh, now. But to do that, you need to separate. The different atoms by lambda over two, where lambda is uh, the wavelength associated to the frequency of these absorbers. And if you separate them uh, uh, physically by lambda over two, something which can be done simply by wiggling the, the, the waveguide like this, then you get exactly the physics that you wanted. 
the, the second important uh, ingredient that we want is this longitudinal coupling. And there are ways to do that directly, but this longitudinal coupling can be a little bit challenging to do. What we know exactly how to do, however, is this dispersive coupling that we keep talking about since, uh, since last week. And so this is how this, we will couple the, 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 the monitoring cavity to the absorbers using this dispersive coupling. And so the way, however, to create a longitudinal interaction is by simply by uh, driving hard this, this cavity. And if we do that, then, uh, um, sorry, that's a little bit more technical now, but if you do that, you, you, one way to, to think about driving hard a cavity is to displace the cavity field to account for this drive. So A, uh, uh, which is the field of the cavity, I can displace such that it's read A plus alpha, where alpha is the displacement, a large is the driving, and now A is only quantum fluctuations around this displacement. And so if you do that, you find that if you replace A by A plus A dagger in this Hamiltonian, uh, it approximately looks like this, okay? Where this is exactly what I wanted. Uh, I wanted, oops, sorry. I wanted a, a coupling between B dagger B or sigma Z and A dagger plus A. And now the longitudinal complex strength is chi times alpha. Okay, so, so now we can essentially have a cloud of, uh, of transmon qubits. They are, we know how to couple this cloud of transmon qubit to the cavity. And that's the, and they, they are detuned. That's the Hamiltonian that we want. Unfortunately, when we do the maths, we find that we have additional terms that we wish were not there. So we have these additional terms, uh, which could be problematic. But if we do the numerical simulation, including these unwanted terms, we find essentially the same result as before. So comparing the, the results for the ideal and uh, the actual Hamiltonian. And we find that, okay, we can keep this under control. Right. So that's a theoretical idea, uh, which we have worked out. We thought in enough details that it could be implemented. So uh, this idea was taken by uh, Ifrens Sadiqui's group at uh, Berkeley. So these are unpublished results now. So this is in writing or soon to be in writing, although the results are more than a year old by now. So um, these are experimental results again at UBC, the group are Verfatsidiki and John Mark, uh, a PhD student, former PhD student in the group, uh, fabricated this device. And so what you see here is again, one, two, three, four transmons, okay? You see a waveguide, okay? Where the single photon will arrive. And his waveguide has this wiggly line, exactly what like we suggested to have the, the specific sp uh, uh, spacing that we wanted. And now you have a, a readout cavity, a readout cavity, okay, which is in blue here, which is coupled to all of these transmon qubits. And there's a small detail, you know, something which I, I just alluded to yesterday. There's a Purcell filter, but that's a detail. But yet, what you see is really what you wanted. What you see is this uh, 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 waveguide, which is coupled to four qubits in that case, and a readout KVT. So waveguide, four qubits, readout KVT. And again, here in the real sample waveguide, four qubits, and the readout KVT. Okay, so let's now inject photons into this and see if it works. And so what uh, they do is they cover of our numerical simulation of quantum trajectory. So they repeat many shots of the experiments and each of these lines correspond to different shots of the experiment. And what you see is the, again, this, this signal equivalent to what I plotted before as a function of time. And you do that when you inject photons, red, and when you do not inject any photons, you place a threshold and voila, the, the photons are detected with very little dark cut. Uh, to be 100% clear here, this was not a single photon source that was used, uh, that can be done they started working on this, but the PhD student graduated, John Mark graduated and, and moved uh, before he was able to do that. Uh, they might do it, but now this was done with a weak coherent tone, which is as good as, uh, as we can get uh, to a single photon source. But it's easy to make a single photon source with these qubits. So that's something which could be done. I'm tempting 
tempted to go over this, assigning to be a little bit of a, of a detail. Uh, let, let, let's skip this. But the one thing that I can say is that by by playing with this uh, this um, this threshold, you can change the detection detection efficiency. You can trade detection efficiency to dark count, and you can have detection efficiencies of ninety percent in this first experiment. Not bad. Uh, uh, depending on the diagram that you have, you have, uh, uh, of course, a lower efficiency. Okay, so that's uh, this idea of uh, itinerant, itinerant uh, single photon uh, detector with a, a bandwidth, which is the bandwidth of a, a typical transmon or a tra uh, 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 of a transmon which is strongly coupled with it, with guides so here. Them to a few tens of megahertz. The next uh, part of the talk would be the broadband version, but I believe that this might be a little bit too much now. So I will take questions and, and let me know if you want me to say something the broad, about the broadband version. So don't be shy, we still have some minutes. Eh? That was a lot there, so maybe. Uh... Ah, there oh, are. You want to start? That are... Yeah, okay. Stephen? Okay, uh, thanks. Um, this was very interesting. Um, the chat is disabled, by the way, at least for me. Um, um, the the I, what, sorry? The chat is disabled. Um, ah, okay. I don't know um, if it should be enabled, but- um, Sorry, I fix it, but uh, we like to hear <laughs> um, people- I, I would be interested to hear like uh, a few words about the broadband version, maybe not too detailed, but- um, sure. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm of course happy to do that. Um, okay. I need to choose. Uh, that's a whole other talk, right? I could talk for an hour now about this. So uh, uh, let me choose uh, well what I want to say. But the main idea is that we also always uh, again want to always on detector, which is quantum non-ebullition, but now with a larger bandwidth. Uh, and the intuition is the following. So we saw that going from one to many absorbers was good. And so we decided to push this, right? And at some point, um, this is no longer a, a, a line and a cloud of atom. This is really some kind of nonlinear metamaterial, okay? Uh, and this is really a medium through which the photon will travel. And the key idea is we found a way to engineer this longitudinal interaction between a, a, a linear waveguide through which a photon can travel without deformation and a proud cavity. So we found a way to engineer this, um, this, this, this longitudinal-like interaction. Uh, the key thing here is that the photon simply travels through a medium. It's never absorbed by anything. And this is why the detection bandwidth can be large. Well, before the bandwidth was always limited by the, 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 the line width of the absorber. Now there's no absorber. So the photon just travels and the, 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 there are some limitations of the line width, but they're not limited to some absorber mode. The price that we need to pay is that now we need thousands of Josephson junctions. Uh, 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 the complexity is um, similar, or in fact, a little bit higher to uh, type of uh, amplifiers that are now routinely used by essentially all groups in the, in the field of circuit greedy, which are known as Josephson traveling wave parametric amplifiers, which are essentially uh, Josephson junction based. Uh, uh, non-ear transmission lines. 
And so what we did in collaboration with the group that I developed, let's say interest in DDK again, and then with a group that I developed in the first place, these uh, nonlinear amplifiers, we, 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 we tweaked the design such as to turn this into a photo detector. And maybe I can just show what it looks like. So I try to give the intuition, but I will uh, show what it looks like just to frighten you a little bit. So the what you see is in orange is the is the waveguide through which the photon travels. Okay, and if you're familiar with waveguides, you're used to see inductor uh, along the waveguide and capacitance to ground. So now here we need to do a special waveguide, some left-handed waveguide, where there's also capacitors here and, and inductor is there. So that's a still a linear object, but it, it's slightly weird. And now that's continuously monitored by this uh, cavity. I'm showing this. This is a waveguide transmission line resonator cavity. I'm just showing one ground plane. And the magic here is in these couplers. And these couplers are uh, known as uh, snails in the field. They are a bunch of Jordison junctions on which a flux is applied. So this is a rather complicated object, but what our colleagues tell us is that this can be in principle done, but uh, to be honest, we still have to work with them to, to uh, tune in exactly all of the parameters. Uh, uh, um, we know that we're in the right uh, ball game for the, the parameter range for the parameters, but now we need to work exactly with what they can and can do in the clean room to nail down exactly the, the last parameters. But this is what it looks like, and that's the intuition. How that helps. And if you want to learn more, please uh, look at this paper. I think Leonardo had a question. Ah, yeah, you're still here. So do you want to unmute yourself? Sure, yes. Uh, so thank you for your uh, very interesting lecture. So uh, my question is the following. So suppose uh, I, I'm able to uh, fire a photon uh, down uh, some tube and, and uh, I'd like for this photon to, to, uh, um, to survive, let's say, for a reasonably long period of time in order to look whether or not the frequency of this photon changes as a function of time. Um, oh. Would such an experimental setup be able to detect variations in the uh, detected, uh, in the photon energy in like one part in 10 to the 16 or some? Oy. Okay, so you want to measure a photon but also know its energy? Yes. Uh, This, the, the broadband one will not do it. Uh, so, okay. Um, yes, I can imagine a way to do it. Uh, no, probably not with the resolution you're talking about. Mm. And one way to do that would be to have, um, well, let me, um, let me see if technology will uh, will uh, just give one sec. I need to draw something, but technology is not quite <laughs> working. Ah, okay, yeah, it is working. Great. Okay, so um, uh, so you see if. Uh, uh, what I could imagine doing is having a bunch of narrow band detectors, right? So what I could imagine doing is having a, a detector here and another detector and another one and another one, and each one are being monitored. And if each of these is narrow band, right? You, in principle, what will happen is that the photon will travel and be absorbed by the relevant one, which will go click. Right. Um, so yes, you could imagine something like this. Um, um, but then to have a very fine grain resolution, you need tons of very narrow band detectors. That sounds very challenging. 
but we, I mean, I may, I'd be interested in talking and seeing. So what is there, is there a next best thing we could think about? Sorry, I didn't catch the, the very last thing you said. Yeah, I, I'm cur I would be curious to know, um, uh, maybe not now, but at some point uh, to, to hear why you want to do this and is there a next best thing we could, we could think about in more than uh, 10 seconds uh, uh, right. live? <laughs> sure, so, so uh, um, the idea would, um, so, so the idea comes from the way uh, photons would propagate in a axion-like particle background. So uh, uh, we know that, um, so in the iconal approximation, so assuming that, um, so the curvature is very, is very small, uh, we would expect um, there to be no chiral light bending. So that means that mm -hmm. uh, right or, or left circularly polarized light would not bend. So the implication of that is that the, the uh, um, energy and the wave vector of the null geodesic, so in this case it would be the photon propagating, uh, would, would vary as a function of time uh, since their emission. Um, mm -hmm. So some estimates suggest that this change in, in, in the frequency would be of order 10 to the minus 16 or something like that. So it would be very, very okay. challenging to uh, sort of predict. So I, I'm, I'm a theorist, so I'm in, uh, from uh, dark matter phenomenology. So I, I'd like to know if there's some uh, experiment that uh, could be competitive uh, and then help us. Yeah, so I, I would have to think about it. That's 10 to the minus 16 seems very difficult. Uh, my, my feeling is that the number splitting detector that we talked, that I talked about uh, before, right? The detector where you had, uh, which was relying on this number splitting, pi pulse one, here you have one less requirement, which is having good absorption. The photon just appears where you want it to be. So maybe you could, I don't know, just intuitively, there is one less thing to optimize on. You could try to optimize for something else. But right now, I don't know. I don't see a way to do that. But again, I'm interested in thinking more about it and maybe discussing. OK, well, thank you for your answer. OK, well, thank you for the question. Okay, do we have uh, other questions, other doubts? So Alexander will not be here tomorrow, so this is your last chance. No, you can write him offline, but. <laughs> yeah, please do not hesitate. Oh, uh, by the way, uh -huh. if you're not asking question, I will hijack this time to, uh, show this. Uh, so this is the, the new building for the ST Quantic, which is uh, uh, almost done now. That's a few weeks old. It will be pre ready uh, in three weeks uh, now. So it will be a great place to do anything quantum. So if you are interested or know someone who's interested in uh, quantum information with a variety of platform, including, of course, uh, uh, circuit QED, uh, experimental or theoretical, please uh, don't hesitate to write to me. I think it will be just a, a great environment to work in. Super. Sorry cool. for the publicity, but. Uh... <laughs> no, no, but in which city is it? That's in uh, Sherbrooke, uh, Quebec. Oh, always in Sherbrooke, okay. Yeah. It's always there. Very nice. Yeah. So the design. Uh, is based on the division fridge, uh, <laughs> circular with uh, these uh, transfer, heat transfer elements. Heat exchangers. <laughs> yeah, heat exchangers. There you go. Okay. So you need to copy this uh, for your lab. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let me thank our speaker again. And... Uh,